Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, thank you for all of the guests who have come um, from far away and a little bit closer. Um, and also, I'm glad to see that there's such a range of people here as well from all parts of society. Um, hopefully, um, the, what I've got to say today um, will give you an opportunity um, to think of questions, ways of interrogating these ideas about the creative city and the cultural economy. Um, if I can have the first slide. Here's that. Okay, so what I want to talk about today um, is about the cultural economy and the city. And I guess the first thing to say is that the cultural economy has come of age in the past decade, I guess. And this is a really important thing to say, um, that uh, I guess there was not much respect given to the field of the cultural economy previously. Um, politicians and economists were only concerned with manufacturing industries, financial services, etc. And the cultural economy seemed like um, the fairy story of Cinderella. Um, Cinderella never came to the ball. Um, now Cinderella has arrived. Um, and um, we find out that the cultural economy um, is something um, that we need to take account of, we need to be, understand it. And now I'm going to talk today um, about some of the issues that it raises in terms of what this thing is, the cultural economy, and how it affects the way that we need to think about policy making, think about cities, think about ways of interacting. So the cultural economy is not just a new item that is added to the agenda of the economy or society. Um, it has transformed the way that we interact and it's transformed the practices of creativity and also the relationship between economy, society and culture. Now I put these uh, um, reports up just to emphasize the point that uh, it's not just a group of academics or interested people who are policy makers um, and politicians wanting to promote the um, cultural economy, but um, UNESCO, the uh, UN organization and the UN Commission on Trade and Development have also recognized that this field is important. Moreover, they have commissioned research and done rigorous um, research that has produced um, at least a foundation of understanding in economic terms, in terms of um, money, in terms of people, in terms of employment, how significant the cultural economy is to all of our lives. And these reports are very important because they tell us not just about one particular country or one particular city, but about the whole world. And uh, this has been really important in terms of starting a global debate about the significance of the cultural economy and its importance for cities and nations. So the headline story, which um, I guess has um, woken up politicians to this debate is the fact that over the past decade or so the cultural creative economy has um, not just become noted in terms of its providing jobs and its providing economic um, activities but the trade in cultural services has grown faster than the rest of the global economy. So it's not just some marginal area of interest, it's actually one of the things that is the leading aspect of transformation of the global economy. And also it's providing employment. So this is from a very low basis, but of course in these days of recession and uh, austerity measures, suddenly to find one area of uh, economic and social and cultural life to be growing, um, is something worth noting. Furthermore, for it to be the area of the economy that has been so overlooked and culture is always seen as something that's not quite so important, um, the fact that this is new on the agenda and important is a really important story and it has changed the political balance and dynamics. So, 
you can have a look at these later, um, or you can have a look at the report, but these are merely rhetorical from my purpose here today. The point is that it shows you, um, these, these data are able to show you that the growth of the cultural economy has been significant, the contribution to um, na national economies has been significant, and that um, this is now a significant part of our economic, social, and cultural life. So, if you like, that's the, the wake-up call, um, and that's all very interesting. Um, and uh, it's not just globally, um, it's also uh, in this region, um, and also you can look, it's not just at, in terms of simply jobs, it's not just in terms of economic output, you can see that different economies are working in different directions, they have different trajectories. This is an analysis done by the World Intellectual Property Organization that again shows you an important point that not every country is the same and their reaction to and their fortunes in this field of cultural economy are very different. I've highlighted um, where Mexico is on the, this data and you'll see um, that uh, it's doing very well uh, in terms of employment um, but not so good in relation to the GDP in terms of the, the economic benefit in some way. Okay, But you can see countries are positioned in lots of different ways and there's a transformation going on here and there's a question for each national and regional economy about how do we engage with this field of the cultural economy and what sort of policies do we think about, how do we make sure that we get the most from the cultural economy in terms of the cultural products, in terms of the jobs, in terms of the economic dimensions. And local research that people have done um, here um, has also demonstrated this. Most nation states have uh, carried out, or the economists of nation states have carried out these uh, studies. They've tried to show how the cultural economy is done, and all the cultural and creative industries have done, in relation to other areas of the economy. And I guess, um, again, this is just to emphasize the point that the um, cultural and creative economy is now part of the leading sectors of many cities and, um, and nations. And I guess why it's important for cities is that uh, primarily the cultural economy is focused in cities, and particularly in capital cities. And some of the work that's been done here um, will emphasize this point. So lots of um, attempts to map the uh, locations of uh, the cultural and creative industries in cities demonstrate that the cultural and creative industries are not evenly spread across the world, they're not evenly spread across nations, and they're not evenly spread across cities. And this is at least interesting, um, but it raises a lot of other issues as to why um, does this matter? Is this significant in some way? And they're the things that I want to talk about in the remaining um, time um, today. So, a lot of work has been done um, in many countries in the world, and many cities in the world, that has established this economic baseline, that has uh, brought the cultural and creative economy to the, um, the negotiating table with politicians, economists, and policymakers. Okay, um, so they have recognized something's going on. The question is, what sort of way should we begin to manage, support, or even disrupt and hinder the cultural and creative economy? Do we know much about how this new field of economic and social and cultural life actually operates? It's clear that it's not the same as the steel industry. It's not the same as the car industry. It's different. How different? And what do we need to know about that? So this first stage of research that people have done has provided us information that tells us that the cultural economy matters, but has not told us in what ways it matters, and in what ways the cultural and creative economy might be different. And I guess what I want to tell you is that it is different in lots of interesting and challenging ways. So it's grown, it's changed. But the old ways that we've had of 
regulating the media and cultural and communications field, um, of creating areas of cultural policy making, of creating government departments that are associated with all these areas. They are rooted in 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And as we noted, in effect, the cultural and creative economy didn't exist then. The cultural and creative economy is different to these areas. The cultural and creative economy is often about flows. It's about intersections. It's about fluidity. And uh, the practices, the ways that people operate and organize themselves in the cultural and creative economy are different to those of normal industries, if you like. And if we're going to make policies, if we're going to respond in any way, we need to understand this and generate new ways of governing. Okay, so the cultural economy is not just a bit more of the same economy. It's something that is different um, and we need to engage with it. Another point is that there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Northwestern Europe and the UK in particular of having, if you like, discovered the cultural and creative industries first. Okay? I'm not sure whether that, that's exactly the case, but nevertheless, policymakers have been quite active in that area. The point is that there is not one single answer. There's not a single best practice model. And um, I get lots of people coming to me saying, what did people do in Britain? What did people do in Europe? Can we copy that? And I think definitely that is not the right question. Yeah? Um, it's not the right question because the cultural and creative economy is different in lots of different places at different times. It's always important on context, on the way that it is rooted in a local culture and society. So culture and the cu cultural and creative economy is about roots, that is how deep it is related to the rest of society and the rest of culture, but also, it's about the root ways, the migration flows, the movement of people and ideas across cities and the world. And more crucially, the cultural and creative economy is about co-production. More than anything else, one of the things that we have to learn is that the relationship between producers and consumers and between every other aspect of cultural production is interwoven. And that may not seem a surprise, but the message that I've got to you is that the tradition of economics and the tradition of um, economic policy making and cultural policy making is that people tend to focus on the producers. And in the cultural and creative economy, the producers are also the consumers. They're also about the people that are the intermediaries involved in this process. This is a complex area that we need to um, address and think about. Um, so my message here is that the culture and creative economy um, is not more of the same. It's different. There's no one best model. We have to understand what's happening in particular places. So let me say a few words um, just to remind you that the cultural economy is something that is engaged in the city, but the, um, the rhetoric of creativity and culture is something that has taken over the world in the past 10 years or so, and everybody wants to be part of it, and they all want a quick fix solution. No um, civic leader, no Lord Mayor um, is going to turn down the prospect of promoting a creative city. Who would not want to be creative? Everybody wants. Okay? So politicians love it. It's win-win. Yeah? Everybody wins. Everybody loves the politician. Okay? But as we all know, it's more complicated than that. And um, the, we have to take account of history. There is a history to relating culture and creativity to cities. And there's a traditional view of the city and culture that we have the city as a museum, that the city beautiful, we decorate our cities, we have fine architecture and buildings, we uh, have visitors who study the heritage, who come and visit the heritage, um, and we have lots of tourists. That's one way of understanding culture and the city. 
Then, there, in the past 10 years or so, there's been a very strong um, pressure um, of um, people that have sought to um, explore the economic potential of culture and creativity to the city. The economic potential to attract people to the city so that they invest in that city. So this is the story of foreign direct investment. How can we make the latest biotech in industry, how can we make the latest financial institution come to our city? Yeah? Um, why choose Mexico City rather than um, Guadalajara? Why choose Mexico instead of Buenos Aires um, or any other city? Okay? And the argument is that the thing that makes cities different is culture. So culture is the unique selling proposition. So promote culture, promote tourism, and the CEOs of financial services companies will say, yes, let's relocate our offices in that city. Okay? And the city may say, we'll have a new opera house. We'll have a new contemporary art gallery. These will attract people to our city. So the important message here is that this is about place marketing. It's about cultural consumption. It's not about culture and creativity. It's about selling your city, okay? which can be important, but it doesn't address our core interest, that is, of culture and the creative economy. There's a third strand of argument here as well, and a third strand of policy making that's been important. And that is that people have recognized that the culture and creativity has lots of other roles in society. We all know that if we read a great book, or we go to a great theater performance, or we any cultural experience, we feel better. Yeah? Or we might um, do things, we might go in a group, and it might be about social solidarity. It might be about creating a community feeling around a festival, etc. We know all of these things are important, and they do transform people's lives. Okay? It's really important that they do give people, they make people feel better, they make people happier, etc. Now, the unfortunate thing is that many cities and many countries around the world have say, said, oh, that's the way we can use culture, because we don't have to justify culture as art, and art for art's sake, but we can say, actually, art helps make people better. Art helps the economy, etc., etc. Okay? So this is what we call an instrumental use of culture. Yeah? It's not art for art's sake. It's the saying, we can have some art and culture because it makes people feel better, because we'll get more visitors to our cities. Okay? So these three areas, heritage, place market, and instrumentalism, are, have become part of the toolkit of city policymakers when thinking about culture and creativity. And they all work in their different ways. But my concern is that they all simply use culture rather than respecting culture and creativity in and of its own right. And the economic story that I pointed to at the beginning showed us that the cultural economy is the fastest growing area of the economy. So why wouldn't you want to focus, focus on the culture and creative economy in its own right? Not just because it can do with these other wonderful things as well. Okay? So the culture and creative economy needs to be considered in all of these ways, but also in its integral way. And this is why we need to consider the cultural economy, as many people refer to it, as a cultural ecosystem. So it involves lots of different interwoven components. So that involves people that are producing, people that are consuming, people that are organizing events. All of these different elements, they are lots of different jobs, they're lots of different activities, that they are all related together. It's like We've all been to the cinema, and we've seen, um, we, we get obsessed with the screen, who the big star is, okay? But we all know that if you sit at the end of the cinema, you see these lines of people, all the people that were involved. 
they were as equally important in producing that film. The people that were doing the catering, the people that were doing the lighting, the people that were doing the filming, the sound engineers, etc., the people that were doing the script, etc. All of these are as important in making the thing happen. And this is the metaphor of the culture and creative economy that we need to understand, and therefore when we understand its full impact and its full um, significance, um, we need to understand um, this. Um, so I guess the point is that rather than simply thinking about the culture and creative economy as um, simply the key stars, the producers, we need to think of all the people that work in the back rooms, all the people that do the support activities. So that's why I see it almost as like um, this pyramid of people, that uh, the person on the top is probably the star who's on the stage, but that star on the stage couldn't function if it weren't for all these other activities. Maybe right down at the bottom there is the high school that they went to and the training in art and education that opened up these possibilities for them that they wouldn't have trained previously and then become competent in these areas and proficient to carry out these activities. So this is the important thing. It's not just the stars. It also includes all of the areas that make up culture and creative life. Okay. Moreover, it's, we can think about it not just in terms of how deep the culture and creative economy goes, but how wide it goes as well. Because um, that it includes not just the old familiar areas of the fine art and the museums and theatre and classical music, but as we all know, in the past 50 years, art and culture and creativity have transformed beyond all um, knowing. And cultural democracy, the variety of cultural forms that we have now, both of traditional forms and of contemporary forms of culture, um, provide us with lots of new forms of cultural expression. So we can have things that are not just the traditional forms of cultural expression, which are, for example, fine art and performance, but why shouldn't computer games be part of this? Why shouldn't um, you know, film special effects be part of this? Why shouldn't blogging be part of this? Yeah? Doesn't matter where in the world you are, the things that I've mentioned are mainly high-tech things associated with it, but if you go in different parts of the world, traditional cultural forms that are important, they also need to be acknowledged as part of the range of culture. And the thing is that all these types of culture require somebody to make them, require somebody to create an audience for them, they require somebody to curate them, to help to explain them to other people, to build an audience, to build an understanding. And it's this idea of the cultural ecosystem that is so important in understanding why the cultural and creative industries are so embedded in the city um, and why it creates so many jobs and the variety of jobs, but also why the approach to policy making has to really um, wake up to a new world and a new understanding. And I put this uh, slide up, not for you to read it, but to recognize that this is not just a, an abstract academic idea. This is an idea now that is part of the framework for cultural statistics that UNESCO have established. Okay? So they also have recognized this and are recommending it to nation states as a way of understanding the cultural and creative economy. So it's important to have the right information and the right understanding um, if we're going to proceed in this area. So we can talk a lot about collecting data, and there's always a deficiency of data, uh, particularly as um, many of these areas of the culture and creative activities did, literally didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. So nobody collected data on them. Okay? Um, but the traditional ways that um, um, academics and policymakers have looked at the field of the economy has been very much linked to this idea of production. So people are very interested in inputs and outputs. They're interested in the number of employees. They're interested in the gross value added to the economy, imports and exports. They're interested in spatial mapping, showing that there's clusters. They, they're interested in all these things, and they're all important. But they're only part of the story, because the real story, I would argue, 
lies somewhere else. And it's understanding the practices that people engage in to produce and make and reproduce this culture. So that involves the flows and organization and networks. And you find that these are very hybrid forms. They link together things that in the traditional economy we would have seen as separate. So they link together um, areas of the for-profit and the not-for-profit, of the informal and the formal. Okay, so this is very confusing for traditional policymakers because they have little boxes that they put in their categories of the formal economy and the informal economy. Whereas what we have here is an area of economic and social life that is constantly crossing these boundaries. So these issues of flows and also the generation of meaning and values, that's the plural of values. There's not one value. And of course, if you just look at economic valuation, then that is the um, standard way in which we reduce everything to one particular value. But in the cultural field, we have lots of different values, not just economic values, but cultural values. And the question is, how do you resolve these different values? Yeah? Do you simply say, my culture is better than yours? Or do you say that actually there's a range of different cultural values? And then the question is, how do you manage those things? This is the contemporary question. Furthermore, the range of new activities in the culture and creative economy is invariably about a model of risk and experimentation. Yeah? You have to try something and you have to fail. And then you have to create something new. This is the practice of cultural and creative work. It's not right the first time. Um, viewed in a very traditional manufacturing view of life, or, you, or viewed from a traditional bank um, who's giving, or bank manager who's going to give you a loan, if you say, OK, I've got this great idea for a new film. I don't know whether it will work yet. It's a, it's a new idea. Um, people don't understand this type of film. Maybe nobody will come. The bank manager will say, I'm not giving you a loan for that. Yeah? Um, we know it's different in different fields about the questions and understanding of risk and experimentation. Of course, it would be very tempting for policymakers if you could say that every cultural event that you put on was going to be a success. And as you all know, that you could do that. You're all experienced, I'm sure, in the cultural economy. You could do that, but you would know that you will produce the most boring and normative cultural experience that nobody would want to go to. Okay? To have risk and experimentation is how we get change, how we get new and exciting things. So you have to create a framework where it's possible to take risks, where it's possible to engage in experimentation rather than to kill it. And unfortunately, many of the existing policies we have actually tend to destroy the creativity and experimentation. So this is a big challenge. Also, cultural practice happens in a public sphere, and it happens across different communities. We have to know the issues about knowledge exchange, what is a, is a particular good art form, why is this new art form so important that people ought to be engaged in it. We need discussions with that. And traditionally, we call this the scene. Yeah? The scene is where you interact with other people who share similar sets of interests and you go to good parties and you exchange information. This is really, really important. This is the information economy. You need to know what is important, what is um, trendy, what is not. Okay? Who is the best person to be doing this particular form of animation or writing at this point in time? If you don't have that information, then you can't participate. So this cultural commons of practice and knowledge exchange and the, uh, the scene is really, really important. And this is how we bring these things together to hopefully um, build capabilities. Yeah? We can all have individual skills and capabilities, but as communities and cities, what we can offer is not as uh, city planners to take the place of artists and pick and choose and say, 
that's the best art, what we can do is to create an environment in which artists can produce their best work. Okay? And sometimes that means doing the things that are less risky. And one example of a less risky thing to do is provide education, provide training. Yeah? Because these things can be repurposed, they can be reused. They're a great investment. Yeah? So you don't invest in the final product, you invest in the formation. Okay? So building these capabilities is really important. And if it's one of the things that we recognize has happened in the past 20 or 30 years is that nation states and, um, and corporations have disinvested in training and education. Yeah? So this is the very area in which you can build the next generation of creative life is one of the areas that has been disinvested in. And this has become a critical area of risk um, for the future of the culture and creative economy. So building capabilities may not be just about things like education, but they're about events like this, where we bring people together across different disciplines and we say, as the organizers have done here, let's create a platform, let's create a forum in which we can actually allow people to actually exchange information and then create other events after that. Building capabilities is a new soft skill that is tremendously important. And of course, um, we have to recognize one of the other elements about this. To an extent, what I've told you about so far is about lots of positive good news stories. But also, I'm sure everybody sitting in this room also knows that working in the cultural and creative field is the most risky precarious and badly paid area of economic and social life. And there is a big question here about whether this is something that we ought to be recommending to our colleagues and to our children. Is this what we want? Do we want a precarious life in the future? Yeah? Um, is there a way in which we can actually think about incorporating some of these forms of project work and precarious labor, but in a more socially supportive and integrated way. Yeah? Can we think, for example, about a universal living wage for artists? What about these ideas? Yeah? That if you create a possibility of sustaining artists, artists, unless you are going to focus on artists and creatives, who are only from the very richest socioeconomic groups, if you want a full representation of society, if you want cultural diversity, then what you do need to do is support those people and make it possible for them to enter into the labor market. So at the current moment, if you're going to be an artist, then basically you need to be white, male, pale, and rich. Okay, um, so that, um, for example, you um, are not a woman, you don't have children, you don't have a career break, um, you don't get old, you don't get sick, um, you don't require a pension, yeah? all those things, forget it, yeah? if you're going to participate in this sector. Isn't it about time that our policy-making community woke up to the fact that the cultural economy is going to be the future of economies, and therefore, we need a social security system and a welfare system that matches this new economy. These are big, difficult questions, okay? Um, but they're things that we need to begin to think about, not just celebrating the fact that the cultural economy is a man fantastic growth rate and we have more cultural workers in the economy. Important though they are, there are other dimensions about them as well. Just to remind people, and many of you in this room will know this already, is that the way that the culture and creative industries organize themselves is different. Um, as you may know, that if you're an artist, you don't go into a large corporation and punch the clock at 8 o'clock in the morning and go to your easel and start painting in your um, big office. Of course, that's absurd. We all know that the culture and creative industries are organized in different ways. They have different training needs. They have different 
um, organizational forms that adapt to the different markets that they're involved in, and the different audiences they're involved in. This means that they need um, different uh, um, physical infrastructure to work in, etc. So what I've uh, just put here is that the organizational structures of these companies and operations are very different. They tend to be what are called project-based enterprises. That is, that people form a company or an enterprise maybe for six months and then destroy it. Okay? So they have a job for a short period of time, they work together for a short period of time, and then they move on to the next thing. Now, this is a big problem for traditional economists who traditionally have measured how well an economy is doing by something called the, the, the new firm formation or the death of new firms. Okay? And they see the death of new firms as a bad thing. Whereas in the cultural economy, the death of new firms is the vitality of the economy. So everything is turned upside down. Okay? We have to be sensitive to these things. So firms are operating not in large corporations, but in networks. And they are constantly changing. Moreover, the fundamental component of the, uh, this economy is micro-enterprises. Now, some people in government talk about small and medium-sized enterprises. And when they use that term, it appears that they're speaking the same language. But if you go to an economist and say, what's a small and medium-sized enterprise? It's a, an enterprise that usually employs about 100 people. A micro-economy, a micro-enterprise, employs one or two people. It's a totally different world, okay? And we have to recognize that there are different needs and different problems associated with this. Now, this, all this diagram shows is that the, uh, one of the characteristics about all of the areas of the cultural economy, although they're different, is that they tend to have a larger focus on their economic output and employment focus in terms of large companies in the economy and in terms of very, very small companies. What they lack is something in the middle, okay? And why that matters to us is that it's the middle that is where the coordination takes place, okay? And in the traditional multinational enterprise, then you have a big middle. That's the bit that does all the coordination. In, the, in this new economy, then where we have a strategic gap is something that coordinates you to a larger enterprise. So if you're a freelancer working as a musician, then um, you may publish your material directly on the internet, but you're still uh, maybe reliant on the internet service provider, or you may be reliant upon a legal entity or on a distribution company, which will be a huge organization um, globally based. Okay? So this question of who's doing the management in the middle is often about who gets a good deal. And as is obvious most of the time, if you've got the most expensive lawyers and you have the biggest enterprise, then you get the best deal. And if you're a freelancer, you tend not to do so well. Okay? Um, so there's another really interesting area we're seeing in many cities around the world that freelance workers are now forming unions. There's a, an organization in the UK, in London, called the Carrot Workers, and it's a strange name, but basically it works on the idea that to encourage a donkey to walk along, you dangle a carrot in front of them, and they keep on going, okay? This is the analogy with what it's like to work in the freelance economy, yeah? There's always the possibility of work tomorrow, but never work today. But all of those people working in that economy need to organize themselves because they have common interests. So, this is a new area that unions and labor organization hasn't engaged with as well. It's yet another change that we have to engage with. So, just to reinforce the point that in this new area of the cultural and creative economy, the world is different, life is different, the speed of turnover of ideas of fashion is very, very rapid, risk is great, portfolio management is, is, is the name of the game, not individuals. Now, just to remind you that if you go to a management school and you talk to managers who are expecting to go into large organizations, 
to talk about the skills that are used in the everyday in the culture and creative economies will frighten them to death. Yeah? This idea that they have to deal with so much change and innovation shows why the culture and creative economy has really got some special skills that people have to deal with this amount of risk, this amount of innovation on an everyday basis. So that's one skill. But another is one that we seldom look at, which is the issue that if you're working for yourself, that actually a new and important area is reputation. Yeah? You're only as good as your last job. Okay? Your reputation relies upon what you did last. So therefore, you have to manage your reputation. Yeah? So reputation is about a value and a value system. When, when, if I need to work on a project, shall I choose to work with you, or you, or you? How do I choose? And I check what your reputation is. Do you work in a group well? Do you complete a project? Do you go running off and do something else and leave us to finish the project? These are the important skills we need to know, and it's why we need to spend a lot of time working face to face. We have to know everybody. We have to hear the gossip. Who's good? Who's not good? Who's to be trusted? Who's not to be trusted? Yeah? These are the things that are everyday decisions in the new cultural economy. Okay? That uh, um, are really, really important. And moreover, these divisions that we traditionally had between the formal and the informal, between the for-profit and not-for-profit, I could go around, I'm sure, and ask any of you in this room and say, which category do you fit in? And they would say, well, I'm working as a barista in the morning and I, do, I work on this uh, commission to do some art in the afternoon and maybe next week I'm working on a paid job for an advertising agency. So where do you fit? Which category do you fit in? This is the real life. And what we need to do as policymakers and of people concerned with the creative economy is to recognize the world as it is, not as we think it might be from our old models. This is a really big challenge for everybody uh, involved. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, I just include some local data. This is from Mexico, showing again that I wasn't lying about the micro sector of the economy. It's very large here. In every country of the world, um, this is exactly the same. Um, so, the key message here is that we, what we have to do away with is what I call binary thinking. That is thinking in terms of either this or that, and thinking about putting things in one box or another box. And all of the old binary words that you come across all the time, commercial, non-commercial, formal, informal, instrumental or intrinsic, high, low culture, economy or culture, civil society, state. If you're working in the culture and creative economy, you're constantly crossing these boundaries all the time. Yeah? And we need to understand this and embrace this and understand seriously what it means to work across boundaries in a hybrid way, to follow the processes of cultural production wherever they go. Yeah? and to explore the challenges to the different value systems, and they may be um, cultural value systems, they may be economic value systems, they may be ways of life. Yeah? And this gives us lots of challenges in order to assess the outputs and the processes. Anybody involved in management and uh, government processes has to evaluate the work that they do. And they tend to evaluate things by outputs. But as we know, um, that uh, in a cultural field, the process is as important as the output. Yeah? Um, and therefore, we need evaluation tools that speak to processes, not just to outputs. And therefore, we have to be careful about falling into old categories about evaluation. We all know that if you go to a government department and say, um, you know, can I have some funding for this particular artistic project? They'll say, yes, there's a check sheet 
here of all the things you have to say. And the only things we're interested in is demonstrating the value for money and the output measures. And as a city government, we measure these in a number of different ways. Uh, so that is how many people came to your exhibition, yeah? um, or how many young people came to your exhibition versus older people. Or you know all the questions. Okay? So these are, these are questions that have very little relevance to the quality of the art that was going on, but they fulfill somebody else's agenda. These are things we need to um, campaign about, we need to um, discuss with everybody concerned so that we actually bring new values and new ways of working uh, with the cultural economy. So, have I got five more minutes? Uh, so we started a little bit later, so I think I'll just... What I want to go on to now is just to take some of these ideas and just to move forward to thinking about um, what new policy making will look like. Um, so again, sorry, that was... So we need to think about the new organizational needs, how they translate into the new spaces. So no longer do we need large office blocks, no longer do we need large factories, we need new spaces for artistic production. What will these look like? Well, they're different for different areas of activity. We need to go and investigate that. What do artist practitioners want of space? What do freelancers want of space? There's this myth about the world of freelancers is that somehow they don't need any space. They have their laptop and they have a coffee shop. Well, the coffee shop is a sort of public agora. It's where they can go and plug in their laptop. Yeah? That's an important space. Yeah? But maybe we could do things better. Maybe we shouldn't rely on Starbucks to support the cultural economy by buying their coffee. Yeah? Maybe there are other ways of organizing forms of social interaction. Freelancers need to touch base. They need to talk to one another. The workspaces, what about if people are increasingly working from home? Is there enough space at home? When we designed our housing stock, we didn't imagine that people would be working at home. When we um, designed our workplaces, we didn't imagine that people would be working in the ways that they work today. So the redesign of workplaces, how we engage in that is really important. We need to understand what sort of connection people make. Online connections are important, but they're not sufficient on their own. They require what you're doing here today, which is meeting face to face, and it's the reason that I'm not on Skype now. I'm here, and somehow that makes a difference. And if it didn't, then people wouldn't have paid to send me over, you know? And we all recognize this. This is a really important thing that we gain something by being in direct interaction, okay? We recognize this in terms of the way that we organize our cities and organize our new cultural and creative um, places. And uh, there are big questions about co-working spaces, studio spaces. Where are these going to provide, be provided? And invariably, the, the, the question is that there is no space for the artist in the city. Yeah? All the property is too expensive. Or the usual story is, We'll attract the artists to the city when the area is very run down. Yeah? And then when everybody wants to go there, it's hip and trendy, we'll say, okay, the rents will go up and we'll say, goodbye artists, we don't want to know you anymore. Okay? We all know this story. Um, and this is a big problem um, in terms of not just for artists, but which other industry would you treat like that? Would you say to the financial services industry, okay, we're gonna let you move into this part of town because it's very run down. You can develop that, but after a couple of years, we'll say, no, you can't stay here any longer. You've gotta go somewhere else. People would think you were crazy, but we do this with artists and creatives every day. Yeah? So this is a, a big issue. I'm not going to uh, talk about this. This is a bigger issue about international relations and the way that local economies link into bigger systems of cultural production and also the regulation of cultural production. And I'm sure you've heard lots and lots about uh, intellectual property rights and, uh, and the World Trade Organization, etc. 
But those things matter as well. They also affect what artists and creatives can do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is my point. Um, this is a, a little um, um, illustration. This cartoon here um, is by one of our uh, very famous artists in the UK at the moment, uh, Grayson Perry. And uh, he is making a joke, but very true joke, um, about what happens to run down um, spaces. So in the top left hand corner you see an old industrial factory yeah? and uh, then artists have squatted the factory yeah? and in the next one you can say that uh, it's been um, formalized and somebody's put on the idea that this is now artist studios. And the third one um, you see that this is now called a creativity hub and it's painted nice bright color and there's a cafe at the bottom and uh, the old bike that was rotting in the street now is uh, hanging up there. In the hipster economy you've got to have a fixed wheel bike of course. Yeah? So, uh, the, and then the final one is that the creative hub is all over and now these are now called New Bohemia Apartments. Yeah? Um, and the thing is that we see this happen time and time again in the city and it only takes four or five years. Okay, so this is uh, urban regeneration on the cheap by the market, and the, um, the victims are artists. But it's not a victimless crime. This uh, is a uh, demonstration in central London, in Brick Lane, um, where there, is a, there are a lot of artists being evicted from their studios and also a lot of tension with the local community. And uh, here are people demonstrating against the fact that gentrification um, has raised the prices for artists and they're being forced out of this part of the city. Incidentally, this part of the city in London, in the East End uh, called Brick Lane, if you fly into the country and look in your in-flight magazine, it will say visitors should go to this hip and trendy new area called Brick Lane. Yeah? So at the very time that this has been appropriated by marketing and tourism, you're killing the very artists that are there. This is the problem that we face up to. Yeah? Do we just say, okay, that's the way it is, or do we address this problem? And it's a complicated um, problem. So we need to have some big issues about thinking about hard and soft infrastructure. Do we simply build a new art gallery, get a new Guggenheim, uh, get a new building that we'll, we'll call a creativity hub? Is that the solution? Or are those needs actually rooted in the creative economy? What does the creative economy need? What do, what do artists need? What do creatives need? Do they need a flashy new building that uh, they won't be able to afford to occupy and is in the wrong place? Yeah? Or do they need something more low level? We need to find out these things. We need to build resilient creative economies, not to simply have this upfront prestige investment, which then in two or three years is then a, um, what we call an albatross. It's, a, it's a, something that causes um, the failure of the whole system. We need to think about these ways in which local creative economies work. And they're to do with sustainable property models, they're to do with training, and they're to do with cultural intermediaries as well. So finally, um, I just want to say that we then need to move this, these ideas into tactics and we can think about these and work on them with our cultural and creative communities. But some of the things that we need to think about is we need to ask ourselves a question. We need an audit of what are the strengths and weaknesses? What are we good at? And what are the things that we need yeah, as artists in terms of our local creative community? We need to think about what training we need, what spaces we need, what facilities we might need. We also, and what part of this event is hopefully, and part of the UNESCO reports, is we need to gain some respect. Artists shouldn't be kicked around. They should be treated as respected citizens who contribute just as everyone else does to the economy. And they need to be treated with that respect and accorded that respect. We need to understand that education and training are a key part of this process. But finally, I would make a plea that the biggest new skill set that we need is that of cultural intermediaries. People that understand what artists say, have a reputation with artists, but also can speak the language of policymakers and politicians, and then can speak to both of them. They can be translators between the two. 
because we have two worlds and we need to bring them together for the benefit of both communities. Thank you very much indeed.